Previous chapters identified macroeconomic issues of growth, business cycles, recession, and inflation. In this chapter, the authors begin to develop tools to explain these events. The central purpose of this chapter is to introduce three basic macroeconomic relationships that will help to organize macroeconomic theories and controversies. The relationship between income consumed and income saved, the relationship between the interest rate and investment, and the relationship between changes in spending and changes in output. So it can really be broken down into three main categories or sections. The spending multiplier is a key concept in understanding the effectiveness of fiscal policy in the chapters to come. DI represents disposable income or income after taxes and is the most important determinant of C, which is consumption spending. What is not spent is called saving. Both consumption and saving are directly related to the level of income. So we can make the following conclusions. Households consume a large portion of their disposable income and spend a large portion of a small disposable income than of a large disposable income. Households have a smaller proportion of small disposable income than of a large disposable income and desaving is consuming an excess of disposable income, as we like to call it, debt. Households dissave by borrowing or by selling accumulated wealth or assets. This figure shows the consumption and disposable income for the U.S. from 1987 to 2009. Each dot in this figure shows consumption and disposable income in a specific year. The line C, which generalizes the relationship between consumption and disposable income, indicates a direct relationship and shows that households consume most of their after-tax incomes. This figure represents graphically the recent historical relationship between disposable income, consumption, and savings in the United States. A 45-degree line represents all points where consumer spending is equal to disposable income. Other points represent actual consumption or disposable income relationships for each year. If the actual graph of the relationship between consumption and income is below the 45-degree line, then the difference must represent the amount of income that is saved. Notice that consumption can exceed disposable income and personal savings can be negative. This table shows the consumption and savings schedules and propensities or tendency to consume and save. Propensities to consume and save will be presented in later slides. A hypothetical consumption schedule shows that households spend a larger portion of a small income than of a large income based on the average propensity to consume. Note that desaving occurs at low levels of disposable income where consumption exceeds income and households must borrow or use up some of their wealth. The break-even income is where consumption equals disposable income and savings equals zero. In this table, the break-even income occurs when disposable income equals $390 billion. This figure shows consumption and savings schedules. The two parts of this figure show the income consumption and income saving relationships in table 27.1 graphically. The savings schedule in B is found by subtracting the consumption schedule in A vertically from the 45 degree line. Consumption equals disposable income and saving thus equals zero at $390 billion for this hypothetical data. The definition of the average propensity to consume, or APC, is the fraction or percentage of income consumed, that's APC equals consumption divided by income. If you multiply the fraction by 100, you can express this as a percentage. See column 4 in table 27.1. The definition of the average propensity to save, APS, is, a, uh, is the fraction or percentage of income saved. APS equals savings divided by income. If you multiply the fraction by 100, then you can again express it as a percentage. And you can see that in column 5 of the table. The global perspective 27.1 shows the average propensity to consume for several nations in 2009. Note the high APCs for Australia, the U.S., and Canada. There are surprisingly large differences in the average propensities to consume among nations. Australia, the United States, and Canada in particular had substantially higher APCs 
and thus lower average propensity to save than several other advanced economies. Marginal propensity to consume, or MPC, is the fractional proportion of any change in income that is consumed. MPC equals change in consumption divided by change in income. Marginal propensity to save is the fractional proportion of any change in the income that is saved. So marginal propensity to save equals change in savings divided by change in income. This is also the slope of the line when we graph it. Note that MPC plus MPS equals 1. That's an easy way of checking your math. Figure 27.3 shows the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save as the slopes of the consumption and saving schedules. Non-income determinants of consumption and saving can cause people to spend or save more or less at various income levels, although the level of income is the basic determinant. An increase in wealth shifts the consumption schedule up and the savings schedule down. In recent years, major fluctuations in stock market values have increased the importance of this wealth effect. A reverse wealth effect occurred in 2000 and 2001 when st stock prices fell dramatically. Another important factor is household debt. Lower debt levels shift the consumption schedule up and the savings schedule down. Expectations can also play a role. Changes in expected future prices or wealth can affect consumption spending today. The last one's real interest rates. Declining interest rates increase the incentive to borrow and consume and reduce the incentive to save since you wouldn't get as much in return. Because many household expenditures are not interest sensitive, the electric bill, groceries, etc., the effect of interest rate changes on spending are modest. Macroeconomic models focus on real domestic output, or real GDP, more than on disposable income. Movement from one point to another on a given schedule is a change in the amount consumed. A shift in the schedule is a change in consumption schedule and is caused by non-income determinants of consumption. Consumption and saving schedules will always shift in the opposite directions. Unless they shift is caused by a tax change. Taxes shift both spending and savings in the same direction. Lower taxes increase both spending and saving because households will spend part of a tax cut and save the rest. And increases in taxes reduce, reduce both savings and spending. Economists believe that consumption and saving schedules are generally stable unless deliberately shifted by government action. This figure shows the shifts of the consumption and savings schedules. Normally, if households consume more at each level of real GDP, they are necessarily saving less. Graphically, this means that an upward shift to the consumption schedule, C0 to C1, entails a downward shift to the savings schedule, S0 to S1. If households consume less at each level of real GDP, they are saving more. A downward shift to the consumption schedule, C0 to C2, is reflected in an upward shift to the savings schedule, S0 to S2. This pattern breaks down, however, when taxes change. Then the consumption and savings schedules move in the same direction, opposite to the direction of the tax change. For extra credit, report on the following. It'll be 10 points added to your test. You have to answer the last three questions. The second section of this chapter deals with the interest rate investment relationship. Investment consists of spending on new plants, capital equipment, machinery, inventories, construction. The investment decision weighs marginal benefits and marginal costs. The expected rate of return is the marginal benefit, and the interest rate, which is the cost of borrowing the money, represents the marginal cost. The expected rate of return is found by finding the expected economic profit, total revenue minus total cost, as a percentage of the cost of the investment. So the text example gives $100 expected profit on a $1,000 investment for a 10% expected rate of return. Thus, the business would not want to pay more than a 10% interest rate on the investment. Remember that the expected rate of return is not a guaranteed rate of return. 
investment still carries risk. The real interest rate, I, nominal rate corrected for expected inflation, determines the cost of investment. The interest rate represents either the cost of borrowed funds or the opportunity cost of investing your own funds, which is income foregone. If the real interest rate exceeds the expected rate of return, the investment should not be made. The investment demand schedule, or curve, shows an inverse relationship between the interest rate and the amount of investment. As long as the expected return exceeds the interest rate, the investment is expected to be profitable. Figure 27.5 in the key graph section shows the relationship when the investment rule is followed. Fewer projects are expected to provide a high return, so less will be invested if interest rates are higher. The investment demand curve is constructed by arraying all potential investment projects in descending order of their expected rates of return. The curve slopes downward, reflecting an inverse relationship between the real interest rate, so the financial price of each dollar of investment, and the quantity of investment demanded. Page 556 has some practice on it. Shifts in the investment demand occur when any determinant apart from the interest rate changes. Greater expected returns create more investment demand, shifting the curve to the right. The reverse causes a leftward shift. Changes in expected returns result because acquisition, maintenance, and operating costs of capital goods may change. Higher costs lower the expected return. Business taxes may change. Increased taxes lower the expected return. Technology may change, and technological change often involves lower costs, which would increase expected returns. Stock of capital goods on hand will affect new investment. If there's abundant idle capital on hand because of weak demand or recent investment, new investments would be less profitable. So no matter how low the interest rate is, they still may not take it. If firms are planning on increasing their inventories, investment demand shifts to the right. If firms are planning to decrease their inventories, investment demand shifts to the left. These planned inventory changes are based on expectations of either faster or slower sales. If the firm expects faster sales in the future, they will add to inventory. If the firm expects slower sales in the future, they will decrease their inventories. Expectations about future economic and political conditions, both in the aggregate and in certain specific markets, can change the view of expected profits. This figure shows the shifts of the investment demand curve. Increases in investment demand are shown as a rightward shift of the investment demand curve. Decreases in investment demand are shown as a leftward shift of the investment demand curve. The global perspective shows gross investment expenditures as a percentage of GDP for selected nations for 2008. As a percentage of GDP, investments vary widely by nation. These differences, of course, can change from year to year. Investment is a very unstable type of spending. IG is more volatile than GDP. Expectations of future businesses conditions are easily and quickly changed. Capital goods are durable, so spending can be postponed. Firms can choose to replace or fix older equipment in buildings, and this is unpredictable. Innovation occurs irregularly. New products stimulate investment and create waves of investment spending that in time recede. Profits affect both the incentive and ability to invest, and profits vary considerably from year to year, contributing to the instability of investment spending. This figure shows the volatility of investment for the period 1973 to 2009. Annual percentage changes in investment spending are often several times greater than the percentage changes in GDP. Changes in spending ripple through the economy to generate even larger changes in real GDP. This is called the multiplier effect. The multiplier effect is the third and most important section of this chapter. Multiplier equals the change in real GDP divided by the initial change in spending. Alternatively, it can be rearranged so that it reads change in real GDP equals the initial change in spending times the multiplier. Things to remember about the multiplier. First of all, the initial change in spending is usually associated with investment because it is so volatile. But changes in consumption, unrelated to income, net exports, and government purchases also are subject to the multiplier effect. 
The initial change refers to an upshift or downshift in the aggregate expenditure schedule due to a change in one of its components, like investment. The multiplier works in both directions, up or down. It occurs because of the interconnectedness of the economy. This figure illustrates the multiplier process with a marginal propensity to consume equal to 0.75, or 75%. An initial change in investment spending of $5 billion creates an equal $5 billion of new income in round one. Households spend 3.75, equal to 0.75 times 5, billion of this new income, creating 3.75 of added income in round two. Of this $3.75 billion of new income, households spend $2.81 billion, and income rises by that amount in round three, which is 0.75 times 3.75. Such income increments over the entire process get successively smaller, but eventually produce a total change of income and GDP of $20 billion. The multiplier, therefore, is four, $20 billion divided by $5 billion. The significance of the multiplier is that a small change in investment plans or consumption savings plans can trigger a much larger change in the equilibrium level of GDP. The magnitude of the change in GDP is dependent on the size of the marginal propensity to consume and save. This figure illustrates the relationship between marginal propensity to consume and the multiplier. The larger the MPC, the greater the size of the multiplier, or the smaller the MPS, the greater the size of the multiplier. The actual multiplier in the United States, which is estimated between 2.5 and 0, is smaller than the model in this chapter because in the U.S. economy, there are other leakages from the spending and income cycle besides just saving. Imports and taxes reduce the flow of money back into spending on domestically produced output, reducing the multiplier effect. Also, increases in spending can drive up prices, and at higher prices, any given amount of spending will buy less real output.